Thank you. Um, so my name is Hanna Lisa Kangas, and uh, I will be hosting this panel discussion. I, I thought we could warm up with a brief round for all of you. I have two very simple questions. The first is, what are the greatest achievements of Energiewende? Uh, I think the greatest achievement is uh, bringing out uh, or get, getting an example for the world how a modern industrial, industrialized country can make an energy vendor. What I see in Denmark is that we have energy companies, energy providers who are actually focusing on reducing their CO2 emission and their energy consumption. And that is due to uh, this long-term uh, policy that we have. So this is, uh, this is changing the focus from making money to reducing energy. I think the biggest achievement is to show uh, that it is possible to change our development path towards a more sustainable development and a sustainable economy. Many of the things have already been said, but I think an additional one in Germany is simply raising the level of awareness of, of energy policy. It's become one of the major topics in the societal debates, uh, really on the par with the euro crisis in the past past two years. Before, Germans used to simply say that electricity is something that comes from the socket, but, but now, now there's actually a lot of interest in where it comes before that. Okay, now I think we are. Uh, we have warmed up, but let's take another uh, quick question. Um, let's take the other side of the coin. What do you see as the major challenges, you can name one major challenge per person, of Energiewende? And maybe we'll start with, from uh, the other side now. Well, as I listed in my, my presentation, there are really uh, several. There's a long list, but, but maybe, maybe a big one is, is, is bridging the divide between the national and the European level. I think that's something that's really lagging behind in the, in the German debate at the moment. I think the biggest challenge is that we would need a reliable master plan, <laughs> which shows us uh, uh, a short term and also in, in the long term uh, how we will be able to, to manage this uh, very long lasting process and how to bring together the different elements which are involved in this process. Um, another challenge would be to include the transport sector, the agricultural sector and the lifestyle of, uh, of all the Europeans? I think that the one big uh, challenge will come from the markets, uh, from competiti competitiveness uh, in the future and uh, of course the coal price in Europe and the uh, rest of the world. Okay, nice, nice that you ended with the coal price. We have questions from the audience, and most of them considered one thing, which is coal, and the renaissance of coal, which we have been all learning from the media in the past months. And there are, of course, multiple factors behind the renaissance of coal, which means that more uh, new coal uh, power plants are being built in Europe in this time of the climate crisis, which seems quite absurd. There is, of course, the low CO2 price. There is also the shale gas um, in the US, which decreases the... Uh, global coal prices. But the question is in all of these uh, papers, uh, to sum it up, uh, what is uh, the impact of Energiewende in Germany? What is the impact of that uh, in the coal renaissance? And whoever of you wants to start can start. Well, I can say something on that tricky and complex issue, all of that. Basically, it all plays in the hands of of, of, of everyone who was against it in the first place, the recent development in, in, in the past year, when actually the, the share of, 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 of coal in, in German electricity mix increased, and with it the, the CO2 emissions as well. But it has very complex reasons behind it. It's the, the, the global market price for coal, which has gone down, which is partly also due to the shale gas boom in the US, which has in a way, liberated more coal into the world markets and all that. So that, by a way, has an effect on Germany as well. Then there's the whole discussion about the, the emissions trading scheme in Europe, the price of CO2 certificates at the moment. Uh, I, think, I think the main, main solution for, for Germany would be to have, uh, have a higher price on CO2. That, that, that would help. But as you mentioned, the, the investments in new coal-fired power plants, 
I think the main problem in the, in the conventional sector at the moment is that there are no, no investments at all uh, in, in, in any kind of power plants. And, and then the increase in, in coal in Germany, for instance, hasn't really come from new power plants at the moment. It's simply following the market signal and, and actually using more coal than gas because it's cheaper at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's it's true. It it, uh, it somehow illustrates that making a national policy in in, in the energy area is is relatively stupid because it, the market is international and and uh, we can scream and shout and uh, then we can do something in our little niche in Denmark, for instance. But but uh, then what what it could only influence maybe the price and of of other fuels and and. Uh, and that's not so. So we definitely need a higher price on CO2 and a long-term price on CO2, because what what makes it interesting right now, if anybody wants to to in, invest in in fossil fuels, will will hopefully turn out to be a really bad investment, and and that that could only be shown if we have this long-term CO2 price. Um, and but I don't know how we establish it and where we should establish it. It seems that maybe China will be the lead, I don't know. Okay. Um, in Finland, there is about 32-33% uh, of our energy mix comes from renewables, and 80% of that is biomass, and basically the rest is uh, hydro. And the combined share of wind and solar is less than 0.2%. So we are quite far from wind and solar Yes, uh, in wind and solar, we're quite far from uh, Denmark and uh, Germany. And there are questions uh, behind, um, or what are kind of, kind of the problems in Finland. One, one of the problems that we face in here is the NIMBY attitude, not in my backyard attitude when it comes to wind power. And there is a question that, um, do you see this problem also in Denmark and Germany, and how have you kind of gotten over it, what are, what are the, so how do you solve this problem? Uh, in Denmark, I think the most efficient way was to, to make the windmills um, a cooperative uh, investment so that the neighbors got some, some, uh, some payback from the energy produced. And uh, a lot of the windmills in Denmark are actually owned in cooperation between the local people and maybe, or maybe 25% is local people and then 75 is a, a huge investor. But still that makes you more interested in, in looking at a windmill because it makes money. <laughs> yes, of course, this problem also exists in Germany and uh, financial participation is one way to deal with the problem. The other way is uh, early involvement of citizens in decision processes and to increase the awareness of the necessity of uh, building up these new windmills and the new technologies, also including the grids. So we have, we have this discussion more on the side of the grid expansion and modernization and not so much on the windmill. You should dig it down. <laughs> no, I, I just came to one, one little story that we have in Denmark at the moment because government decided that an, so many gigawatts should be made on land-based land windmills. So they asked all the municipalities, would you please make a planning and where to place these this windmills? And all municipalities went back to government and said, unfortunately, we couldn't find a place in our, in our area. And, and when we go and ask the politicians at the local level, they say, of course, we, we acknowledge that we should also build, be, build uh, windmills, but if there's an opposition, why should we pressure, put pressure on people where, if it's the uh, pension companies that are, that are doing the investment? So actually, some of the local politicians say, government, give us a, um, you have to force us. You have to tell us, you, in this municipality, you have to place so and so many, then we will do it. But we're not going to do it as our own decision as long as our, some people are against. And the opposition against windmills in Denmark are now being organized at national level. So we see the same people traveling around every time there's a windmill to be set up. There's the same people raising the debate and saying the same thing and writing in the, in the newspapers. So it's very organized. And um, I mean, I think the solution is more or less to, to, to put them at the sea. 
And we, I think we had two more comments on this. Yes, if I can add on that, I mean, of course, the NIMBY phenomenon exists in Germany as well, but then you have to make the distinction between the NIMBY questions and then genuine nature con conservation issues and nature pro protection issues. And, and, and I think there it's interesting to follow the debate on, on, uh, on offshore wind in Germany, because by contrast to, to the Danish development, it's actually very difficult to build any any uh, uh, windmills uh, close to the shore in, in Germany because, precisely because of nature protection issues. So German offshore will probably be a lot further towards the sea, which makes building that more expensive, maintenance more difficult and more expensive and all that. So these all, all factors play in as well. Yes, I think one, one of the things is that uh, we don't have the same kind of positive uh, examples of uh, energy co-ops like in, in Germany and, and uh, in Denmark. That, that's why we, we still have a strong NIMBY movement in Finland. Uh, the other reason is that the big companies, Fortum and so on, haven't been so interested on, on windmills and uh, that really has had a negative effect on, on the national politics as well. Right now there's uh, one group that is trying to make decisions about making the windmill building easier, but uh, hey, we are 10 years late on this, so, so hopefully we'll get a, a good start now on windmills. Okay, um, I think let, let's next take a very different kind of question, and it's, um, it comes back to what Susan actually said in, I think it was in your presentation that you said that Denmark has exported basically some of your CO2 emissions to abroad, to poorer countries mainly, who are um, actually manufacturing the goods we are using in the northern Europe. So we are exporting some of our CO2 emissions to, for example, China or India. And there is a question that should this be shown, for instance, in food products or other products, what is your carbon footprint or, and should this be taken into consideration when planning politics? Well, I think so. <laughs> and, and another thing is to the international shipping is not is not part of the Kyoto uh, Protocol and the way that we that we uh, calculate our CO two emissions. So, so uh, I think we should learn to do it correctly. But I I realize how difficult it is to get any coordination and agreement between uh, on on CO two in any case. So, so I think it's very difficult. So that's why we sort of start bringing the theme up and bringing, trying to, you give, uh, to raise awareness about that, that energy consumption is one thing, but our CO2 footprint is, is much more. But, but it would be very nice with a label on your, on like, like any other, you can have a la label on all products. You could even have a CO2 uh, budget for each person. And then we could have a, when we, whenever we draw the card, there's a, there's a money line and a CO2 line. I think that will be efficient. Thank you. So now we have one question from the audience. Many thanks. My name is Meri Pukarin and I work at Friends of the Earth here in Finland. Um, first, thanks for the organizers for this very informative seminar. Um, as you know, the debate is very heated around the 2030 targets in the EU. And I was wondering whether you could draw on your experience from Gen uh, Denmark and Germany and comment on whether we should have a coordinated set of an emission, emission reductions target, energy efficiency target and renewables target, or would it be better to only set one target for CO2? Thank you. Okay, I can I can start on that. Very much a debate in, in, in Germany on that already at the moment, of course. Uh, well, I think it's uh, European-wide, it's, it's pretty much said that we will have some sort of a target on CO2 for 2030 as well. So the question is then rather, will we have this one target, will we have, will we have two, will we have three in the, in, in the future? I think, I think Germany is very much in favor of, of, of having the CO2 target, uh, that's for sure. But it's also, given, given the steps that Germany has taken, I think it's very much in the German national interest to argue for, an, for a renewables target as well. 
not only because it will then somehow somehow factor in in, 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 in the German development as such, but also then, then all these uh, competition rules of the EU kick in if you don't have it. If it's no longer a joint, joint uh, European target, then the whole feed-in tariff system in Germany is perhaps a bit more vulnerable to the state aid rules, on, 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 on which then again can, can be seen as, seen as uh, 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 distorting the competition in Europe. So I think, I think Germany will be in favor of, of the renewables target as well. The efficiency target is a, is a trickier one. I think the ex experience from that has been mixed in many countries, and, 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 and Germany was very hesitant to agree to the new efficiency directive in, in, in the first place. So I could, I could imagine that Germany is more or less opting for two rather than three. I think uh, the most important question is not, not whether we have one target, two targets, or three targets. I think the most important question is, um, so how can we build up uh, a coherent energy and industry policy on the European level? And which are the elements uh, which have to be combined and uh, have to be handled in, in this process? And this is the most uh, important point we are after in our uh, union-oriented uh, discussions. And I think there are some elements. Uh, I think we have mentioned them. This is, of course, uh, the expansion goal of renewable energies, but this is also the, the infrastructure goal. So how can we build infrastructures and how can we finance this uh, whole process of uh, infrastructure rebuilding or modernization? And uh, there are, of course, also other points like the master plan. Uh, do we need an, a master plan on the European level? And I think these are the most important uh, uh, goals that I see and not the question whether it's one, two or three targets. So it must be coherent, uh, but on the other hand, there must be, of course, also uh, a, a degree <laughs> of freedom for the different nation, uh, nations and states uh, to, to follow this path. So. I will go for one target, only the CO2, because I think there should be, as you mentioned, a free methodology on how to uh, to fulfill the, the target and um, I think otherwise we would just start quarreling about if biomass is CO2 neutral or not <laughs> which of course it is if you use I mean waste real waste then it is but I mean then we have to make definitions on what is waste and what is not waste and what is nearly waste and, and I think I just see the bureaucracy of that, and it will take 10 years to be to agree. So I'd rather have a very clear CO2 target and an ambition one. Ambition one. Uh, I think that there should be a CO2 target, of course. Uh, I think that it should be mostly for the private sector and the private sector, uh, the, the companies working, working uh, with the industry and uh, energy production, but I think that we should have at least some kind of target for energy efficiency for the public sector in Europe, because we have the biggest public sector in the world, and it's not really energy efficient right now. And uh, the other energy efficiency target should be for, for the housing all around, all around uh, Europe. I think the more important point is that how we're going to solve the problem of capital, capital in, in Europe because, like I said, southern and eastern European countries don't have the capital to be involved in this energy, green energy revolution. So should we have more budget solidarity inside of European Union and put more money from agriculture to... to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from agriculture to the energy infrastructure of, of Eastern and Southern Europe. Okay, from the de quite detailed level of discussion in uh, European climate and energy policy, let's take a few steps back and I, I have a more philosophical question for you. So as a humankind, do you think we have an alternative for energy transition or Energiewende? Do we have any alternative or is this just something we have to do? Yes. 
Well, <coughs> I, I, I personally, I think that we have no other way. And I normally say that um, if there's even 5 or 10 percent uh, for that we, that we don't need it, I mean, it doesn't hurt anybody to do it. And if we invent in 10 years' time uh, energy sources that are CO2 neutral and there's lots of them and we don't need to do any more, we have just loads of energy, fine. Let's, let's, let's uh, change our life again. But the, the impact of not doing anything now, if the projections that we see are correct, is just unbearable. I mean, for the next generation and the next again. It's, it's a matter of also um, leaving some of the oil and gas for the next generation so that they can make plastic and other materials that we, instead of the we just burn it out. So for me, there's no, no, no other option. I can just add that, of course, there are there always are alternatives, but, but all the alternatives are a lot less pleasant than, than, than this one. And, and, and they probably will be, in the long run, also a lot more expensive. So I think this is something along these lines is certainly a way that would be reasonable to, to go. It's not a take it or leave it option. It, it doesn't mean that every single country should act exactly like Denmark or exactly like Germany, but in a way picking bits and pieces that somehow fit the national set of circumstances. For instance, I, I, I cannot really believe that, that Finland is on its way to phase out nuclear in any time soon, but it doesn't mean that it couldn't learn something from, from the example of Germany or from the example of Denmark, which doesn't have a nuclear power in its system at all. Thank you. Okay, let's then go to uh, Danish and German uh, energy policy back into more details. Uh, us as Finns would like to learn from your energy saving and energy efficiency policy because uh, I think we are a bit behind of you. So what kind of measures do you have in place for energy efficiency and energy saving for industry and household sectors? So then I uh, would like to start to answer that question. Uh, uh, we have a program that's called, uh, I don't know exactly what the English name is, but it's, it's uh, basically a CO2 building modernization program, would you agree <laughs> to translate it in that way? Uh, and uh, this is a very successful program. So uh, uh, because this uh, example shows that if you invest public money, yeah, if, if, you, uh, if you have public subsidies, which you invest uh, in uh, modernizing housing, for example, um, you will have the effect that in, in this case of this program, we invested one uh, euro and for each euro we invested in public, uh, of public subsidies, we've got four euros of private uh, uh, investments in this. So there is a self-reinforcing process and I think this is a very, uh, a very good example. And uh, by the way, uh, we uh, introduced that program and we have uh, created about 300,000 new jobs by this program. And therefore, this was very uh, effective. Yes. I'll have to disagree a bit on that. I mean, if, yeah. I'd, if I'd start learning from the German energy, then uh, I wouldn't really start with energy efficiency. Because there, 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 I mean, the, I mean, there, there are so, some examples, exactly as this one, that show some promise. But it's, it's actually that area of the energy transition that's lagging behind the in, in, in the worst way in in, in Germany. And, and alone, Germ the German role in the in the in the negotiation for the for the efficiency directive. I mean, Germany was really the one holding holding Europe back in in, in that. So, so I mean, that there might be in the future several good programs coming up in Germany, but, but at the moment I think Germany has a lot to learn from other countries as well in, in that field. Uh, do we have some examples also from Denmark? Um, yeah, I'll mention two, two examples. We have uh, at the local authority level, the municipality level, lots of municipalities have actually started uh, uh, refurbishing their, um, all their buildings, which is quite a lot in, 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 in the local area. And uh, they do that by, you'd say, investing the, the, the cost of the, or, or the, the, the saving, the energy saving up front. So they 
go take a loan at the bank, have, make the refurbishment and pay back over 10 or, 20 or 15 years or how long time it will take by the, by the saving of, uh, on the energy bill. This is a, a very popular way of, of, uh, of uh, uh, re, at least re, when it comes to buildings. But then I think the most efficient is that the mandatory reduction targets on the energy companies. That is really very efficient. They, they must reduce their, in it, their CO2 emission uh, and they are they're dependent on government and, and they, they, so they go by at the companies, at whoever have a huge uh, CO2 impact. They, they can from their own money invest in, in, uh, in, the, in the transition and then they get the, the CO2 saving for their mandatory saving bill. So, so that's, uh, that's actually very, very efficient. And now we have one question from the audience. Right. Uh, thank you. My name is Lauri Muronen and I work for the Finnish Energy Industries. And uh, firstly, I would like to thank the speakers for their excellent presentations. And uh, on a personal note, because before uh, becoming a little bit antagonistic, I say that this is uh, the vision you have painted here is certainly a very appealing one. But for the sake of the argument, somebody has to say, for example, the N-word, uh, nuclear namely. Uh, I believe the Dan Danish energy transition uh, started with the oil crisis in the 1970s. You started thinking of new uh, sources for for alternative sources for imported oil. And there's another energy vendor that started from the same event, namely the one uh, that France took a different path, albeit um, a very radical one. Uh, it accidentally led, well, firstly it led to uh, France building a massive nuclear fleet, but accidentally it led to the uh, lowest electricity prices in Europe. Uh, basically, France uh, getting rid of the climate problem in terms of its electricity sector and cleaning up the French uh, air quality, basically, in its uh, vicinity of its energy uh, facilities. I would just like to um, hear your opinions about this sort of uh, a little bit alternative energy vendor. Thank you. Yes, perhaps I, I should start because we have a different kind of <laughs> different kind of line in in, uh, in nuclear in Finland than in, in Germany. Uh, I think that shale gas in US and uh, nuclear energy in Finland and uh, in China and other countries who are building it uh, will set them back in the future in this sense that there are production methods of the old ages and uh, okay it's easier to make the energy vendor in Finland with nuclear right now but uh, I don't think that the future of nuclear energy at least uranium based nuclear energy will be uh, so long so long in the future so We'll see, but uh, I think that the most important thing in the energy vende altogether in, in Germany and uh, in Denmark is uh, getting rid of the fossil fuels. So in a way, nuclear energy is not even inside of the accusation uh, in the whole, whole, whole plot, even though in, in Germany it has a big role, at least in the media. I think we, we came over the nuclear discussion in Denmark in the 60s and 70s because there was a huge uh, popular movement against it. Um, and since then it just hasn't been discussed. Uh, actually in our think tank we are, we are planning to take it up and we are being beaten by, <laughs> by all the green NGOs of, of mentioning nuclear power. But I mean, what we hear is that there is fourth generation nuclear technologies that you can, where you can, where you have less risk and no waste, and you can actually use the waste uh, that has always already been produced. And if that is true, and if that can be done, then I think nuclear power is fine. I mean, it is a, it's the environmental or the the risk, the waste that is that is a problem. Uh, and apart from that, I'm not. Uh, we are, I don't think we would be religious in Denmark, but it will take some time to convince people that nuclear power can be a, 
a thing that we can we can think about again. And and I mean we are not more um, um, convinced that we buy nuclear power from Germany and Sweden and use it in Denmark. So <laughs> so um, that that's the trading of, of energy means that that uh, all to to the end of the day we we all we all use all the the the, the, the total mix of, of Europe your European uh, production. So. Um, I think we should look at all all technologies and of course assess the 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 risk and the the waste problems and uh, we just didn't really find a place to have the nuclear power plant in Denmark. Yeah, yeah a few a few comments on that first of all have a comment comment to the point nuclear or coal and actually at least in the German example phasing out nuclear is, is a fairly easy task compared to the task of phasing out coal that's the real real challenge if you take the take the goals goal seriously now now on the um, on the on the new issue of nuclear power in, in in Europe I think it's 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 a fairly a 50 50 situation at the moment within the European Union roughly half of the member states use it roughly half of them don't and I mean, some, somehow, somehow you have to you have to live with that situation on, on, on both sides. And, and and I think when it comes to trading electricity, that should be in a way a normal situation in a common internal market. Uh, at some times, Germany will import electricity from France. At, at times, it will go the other way. And interestingly enough, after the energy event, it has more gone the other way around. Germany has actually increased its exports. To, 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 towards towards France, and that has a lot to do with the with the generation of, of, of the French nuclear power plants. Exactly as you mentioned, they, they developed the fleet in the 1970s and 1980s, and at the same time, to a large extent, also uh, electrified their heating systems, which has led to the fact that they have very very inefficient electric heaters in 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 in, in the housing sector in France, and then on on a on a on, uh, during the cold winter in 2012, for instance. All the French nuclear power plants ran on, on, on full steam in a way to, to, to cover the heating costs as well, which led to a huge demand for electricity from Germany. So actually, you, you can say that somehow the, the, the German renewables kept, kept the French houses warm during, during, the, during the winter. So it, it, it's not always that, that black and white. Black and, white. And, and one further interesting point is that, that, that French are actually, actually very much talking about that there's a big thoroughly organized national debate going on in, in, in France at the moment on, on a French energy transition or a transition energetique, <laughs> and, uh, 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 which, which has somehow as its goal to, uh, to, to reduce the share, share of, of nuclear, which is huge at the moment. It's around 75% of, of electricity uh, generation, and they are aiming at reducing it to 50. So, so in terms of magnitude, it's more or less similar than, than the German one from 25 to nothing. Okay, then we have two questions from the audience. Thank you. Um, forecasts from the International Energy Agency show that global energy demand is growing more than a third until 2035. This will be in China, India, and the Middle East. This will account for more than 60% of the energy increase, whereas demand in Europe is barely rising during this time. Um, demand in Europe is barely rising at this time. Therefore, do we need to consider where European operators will be looking for the future? And how much would a European internal energy market help guarantee these consumers for the global energy market? Will it make a difference? Is this difference um, varied between renewable energy companies and fossil fuel companies, for example? Uh, let's start with China. Unfortunately, China has some coal, so they probably uh, have a national policy that they will continue using coal in the future. So, so probably the market would be for the Chinese to develop more efficient coal plants. Um, probably Chinese and Indian, India will need and, and want to, to have more renewable energies, but uh, on a very strong growth path that they had um, unfortunately, these kind of things are not usually the, the first thing in mind. So, so I don't see a 
so bright future, future for the <laughs> future for the um, European industry to sell out uh, energy equipment to China or India. I think they will produce themselves, and uh, I think the market will be in the U.S. and also in the southern uh, South America, Africa. Middle East. Well, what happened to when the the, the solar PVs uh, fell in price and and Germany stopped uh, supporting them because it was no longer German produced, but Ch Chinese produced was for, because China entered the market, and they well some say they dumped the prices they probably did in the beginning and then they produced them cheaper. And I think we will see that. I mean, if you look at how fast they go from a decision to an act in China, I think we are talking a lot too much in Europe to be in, in the front, in in the forefront of anything, actually. So I, I more, I heard, I think it was just last week that China said that now they've set uh, limits for their CO2, their, their coal use and their CO2 emissions. And, the, and in China, it's so much linked to an environmental problem, and that gives also a popular pressure on on reducing their coal use. So I think that they will actually, that I think they will, I will, will help us solve the problem. Okay, we're starting to run out of time, and we still have two questions from the audience. So let's take them, and then very quick responses, please. Hello, I'm Jukka Helin. I work for the local energy company Helsing Energia here. But my question actually, there's a, uh, another energy related seminar at the moment going on. And um, uh, it's, uh, there's a CEO of Mansalan Energia, which is a local, uh, a small, small city here in, in Finland, southern Finland. CEO of Mansalan Energia told in this seminar just a moment ago that um, his company is going to be in a totally different business in 30 years because um, decentralized energy production and, and all the all the changes in the in the whole energy production field is are so big that uh, his company as it is usually at the moment doesn't exist anymore um, looking from an energy company that's an interesting interesting view so what's the discussion like in Denmark and in Germany how's the big energy companies are they are they destroying themselves you're uh, making big obligations for them to do uh, kind of like destroy their business so what, why is the discussion like over there okay I think we should take uh, qu um, answers from Inge and Susan yeah um, well a transition is of course a huge change uh, we just stopped some of the huge power plants in Denmark that are only producing electricity because we get the electricity from from uh, from the wind so of course it will change the the game for some huge companies and uh, that's what it's all about yes the decentralization of energy production and consumption is of course uh, a big issue in in germany as well um, uh, i have told you about uh, the need of grids that we have and that studies say that we need uh, 3,800 kilometers of grid uh, but uh, many uh, experts and re researchers say that this is completely uh, uh, over what's wrong, over exaggerated yes we do not really we would not need so many kilometers of new grids if we would uh, strengthen uh, a decentralized approach stronger. That means, for example, if you combine uh, combined heating and power units with uh, solar uh, units, then you could gain a lot of uh, uh, efficiency impacts and effects. And on the other hand, building up uh, decentralized, uni decentralized units would mean that we completely can reduce uh, the new uh, grid uh, high voltage grids uh, by this uh, approach and therefore uh, there are a lot of people uh, that are really uh, proponents of, of these more uh, decentralized uh, approaches. I mean we changed our system in Denmark 
to the de decentralized both heat and power plants uh, in the 80s and 90s. And what's happening now is that some of them are, uh, the, they, they were planned by a certain balance between heat and electricity. But now when a, a larger share of electricity comes from, from wind, this balance has to be changed. So we have to close down some of the, or both of the, the central uh, and huge power plants, but also some of the small ones. But, but we are, I mean, we don't have the grid problem. It's, it's all interlinked. I'm really sorry to cut you, but we're really running out of time. So let's take one quick question. Okay, thank you. I'm Joni Keronen, manager of Fortum Foundation and also responsible of innovation development in Fortum. And I have one comment and one wild idea or question. And my comment was regarding these EU targets that uh, I see at least as important to have these mechanisms which are really encouraging investments. Because sometimes the targets are numbers, but if they are not these mechanisms, they will not come true. But my wild idea is that I've studied this new deal. So now in Europe, the economy is getting worse and we have a lot of higher unemployment. And now we have 30 million unemployed in, in, in Europe. So I was thinking this new deal that how the US got rid of the Great Recession and put many people to work building the new infrastructure. So I think that, for example, in Southern Europe and so on, would it be like a very good thought to think that how we could utilize that huge resource, what we have 30 million unemployed people to build this new infrastructure. And this could be, since we are in Kalavi Sorsa Foundation, I was thinking that this could be a good idea for some further study if you have not done it. So At this is go comment. going from costs to investment. So let's take brief answers. Yeah, yeah, I think that we should have a, our own Hoover Dam project in, in Europe, and uh, we should have a lot of investments on, on energy infrastructure all through Europe, but uh, especially in the eastern and southern part. So uh, this is the thing that I think we should do. We should be, use the EU, EU budget to invest in energy, especially because we are losing the competitive edge with US and the shale gas. Sure, thanks. Well, I mean, the, the idea of a new deal or a new green deal is, uh, has, has been making the round for, for quite some time. But I think so far there, there has been fairly little to show for it. And, and, and I think, I mean, if you'd, if you'd be able to start from scratch in Europe, it would make perfect sense. It would make really perfect sense to have a European supergrid ideally combining every corner of Europe and then having renewable production where it makes sense, having, having solar power in the south, wind in the north, and, and, and hydro where it's possible, biomass where there's biomass, and then simply linking all that together, and that should work fine. But we do have some history behind us, and we do have some structures that are already there, and, and, and all that makes that a lot more difficult. In theory, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect perfect idea to somehow Europeanize everything, but, but uh, it's going to be difficult. Still, even, even with these, these caveats, I think, I think trying to bring the crisis argument and, and the renewables and, and, and the energy transition argument more closely together is certainly worth the effort, absolutely. Okay, thank you for the very lively question, uh, discussion and very good questions. I think Mikko wants to say the last words. Indeed, uh, Kalavi Sorsa Foundation welcomes all the good wild ideas to ponder and, and uh, develop further these such issues as energy policies. Uh, I hope that the audience uh, has been as much enlightened during this afternoon as I have because I've been very pleased to listen to each, each of you and, and, and uh, learning from a field which is present in our debates but very seldom we know uh, the scope of it all and I think the intelligent contributions from, from all of you has, has really done a good job. I, I mean in our debate uh, often it, we have only room for one issue. It could be not nuclear uh, plant, shall we have another one or not? Or now, lately, there's been a lot, a lot of talk about the shale gas. And uh, like today, what I, 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 I learned, listen to you, it r doesn't really play a role in this uh, energy vendor in Europe at the moment. I don't know if it's true or not, uh, but at least today it was in a very, very minor position. Or we discuss about the energy questions uh, about, uh, I don't think we mentioned once Russia. 
this afternoon. And usually in energy debates in Finland, Russia is one of the main players. Uh, so I think this was an excellent uh, study, uh, study trip to, to, to see the European uh, in, in energy debate and enter it to, to, to Finland. Uh, one uh, small remark about this uh, question of international European energy market. I do think that we should perhaps debate it more. Uh, like it entered in, 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 in the panel a, a little bit, but I just think about how at this very moment Estonia or Baltic states and Finland are competing uh, if, uh, if a gas uh, port terminal will be built in Finland or in Estonia. And uh, the debate is that if they build it in Estonia, we're not going to play with you. That's kind of the attitude we have on that uh, one, one energy issue. Uh, another point which I, I came to my mind from, from, from the Danish, Danish uh, uh, presentation of, of, of we dis debated today about the energy question, but then what about the raising the awareness of, 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 uh, of uh, food and drink and consumption, which were huge compared to this important field that we tackle today. But we can't do everything in one seminar, so I think this was a very good uh, contribution on this share. And luckily we have many, many good topics in the future to arrange good seminars with our colleagues from Europe, the FEPS. I thank you a lot, uh, and, and uh, the audience as well, and I hope to see you in the future. Kalevi Sorsa Foundation seminars. Follow our website, join our mailing list, and have a very nice summer ahead of you. Thank you all.